Hi, I'm Katie, and this is the 16th episode of Ornamentations, which will feature a parade of posy, an update on some of my whips, a new home for the Marie Antoinette Smalls, a look at my recent travel project, and a new giveaway, among a few other things. So there's a ton to talk about today, and I thought we would dive right in. First of all, an update on my upcoming show with Debbie Atelier, which will feature my beaded basket that I gave you a sneak peek of in the last episode. The show is called Outside In. It is running at the San Francisco School of Needlework and Design in the city of San Francisco from this Saturday, March 19th until May 21st. I hope you will be able to stop by and check it out if it's at all possible for you and if you're in the Bay Area. The opening is going to be this Saturday, March 19th. I myself will not be able to attend due to a prior commitment, but Debbie will be there and she'll be speaking about her work at four o'clock. So I would urge you to stop by. You'll see my beaded basket and then some of Debbie's extraordinary, very dimensional, very contemporary and incredibly original work. I will also link to her platforms in the description below. So I'm really excited about the show. I hope you'll get a chance to see it if you can. And then let's move on to some of my work for today. So in previous Smalls Parades, which was I think episode three and episode eight, but there may be more, it's amazing how quickly you lose track. I haven't been doing this that long and yet it's like, wait, which one was that again? But in previous Smalls Parade, I've showed you some of my first posies, one of which was this variation inspired by jewelry in which I started incorporating crystals and different colors and all kinds of embellishment into my posies. And since I showed you that, I have been keeping going. I've been making more and more posies, experimenting with color, with form, and with embellishments. So the first two I'm going to show you are really color embellishments where I was trying to get different shapes and different colors. This is my daffodil posy. And I wanted to see if I could actually get that dimensional daffodil head which as it turns out I could and then I used different shades of yellow and green accented with gilt check pearl to make this little piece which I'm really very pleased with how I turned out. I was trying to see you know what kind of different shapes could I make with this technique and I loved the result. If you follow me on Instagram you will have seen these before but I really think a still photo can't do them justice. They're so sparkly and so dimensional and just I love these. Not only do I have a lot of fun making them, I think the finished product is just lovely. And then these are my daisies, which is an, an experiment for the eventual Marie Antoinette box. And this actually isn't going to go in the Marie Antoinette box, but I have fun seeing different shapes I could make these layered daisies here stamen centers in the middle, accented with crystals, doing buds with rounds and then flanked with um, silk wrapped um, sepals, whereas in the past I've done silver on drops. And then this overall very pale color palette in a slightly different spreading form, whereas my other ones have taken the form of bouquets with a single terminating point. So this was an experiment in different construction and shapes, which I think turned out really well. So you can see, yeah, these are very dimensional, very textured. They really pop because they have so much shape to them. So these are really color and shape experiments, which I'm very pleased with. And then the last new one I'm going to show you today is like this earlier posy, which you've seen before. 
an experiment in trying to bring ideas from jewelry into this technique. So for this posy, I was inspired by a wonderful piece of historic jewelry that's in the collection of the Victoria and Albert, and I will link to this in the description. You have got to see this piece. It has to be seen to be believed. It's enormous and it is all diamonds. This is a Devant de Corsage, so it's a bodice ornament. The real thing is legitimately huge and it's on a technical level an incredible piece of work but part of what interested me was the structure of this piece the flow the sprays and just the amount of movement that this had the different shapes it brought in and made into a beautiful cohesive whole i'm obsessed with this piece of jewelry and i wanted to see what i could do with that in posy form because i will never own this or anything like this but i can have fun with threads and that's what i decided to do i don't think i did justice to the idea but this is my version which i'm calling the victoria and albert posy and it uses metal check pearl and crystals to replicate the look of all those sparkly diamonds got some very elaborate centers, again, sprays of check pearl, and then dangling drops, as you saw with this posy, also inspired by a piece of jewelry. So this is the Victoria and Albert posy, and I did experiment a little bit with the structure, trying to replicate the movement, but it was a little unwieldy, so I don't think I'm done. With this idea, like I said, I have so much fun making these. I'm always thinking of new things to try, new embellishments, new colors, new techniques, but I wanted to bring you up to date with some of the fun that I have been having with these pieces. Now, uh, if you want to bring some jewelry inspiration into your own stitching, whether you're making a posy like this or a stitching piece of your own design, one of the best sources for inspiration is Pinterest. There are a lot of wonderful jewelry books out there. I have some, we'll take a look at them in upcoming episodes, but they're bricks. They tend to be either single maker, like all Cartier or all Van Cleef and Arpels, or single topic, all on tiaras. So for a really wide ranging range of inspiration and also free inspiration, Pinterest is a really great source. You can type in jewelry, floral jewelry, 18th century jewelry, etc., and just start going on what interests you and Pinterest will keep suggesting more and more pieces of interest. So this actually came off a Pinterest board, which was what led me to the Victoria and Albert original. And if you're interested, I think that's a great place to start. So those are my posies. I absolutely love them. I hope you are enjoying them too, because I don't think I'm done with these. I just have way too much fun with them and the possibilities really are endless. But we'll get back to some of my regular stitching and that is my current Christmas project. So my do a little Christmas stitching every day is continuing and my current project is Artful Offerings Cranberry Christmas. And this design really appealed to me because of all the negative space here, which is a little unusual in cross stitch. It tends to follow more of a sampler style of lots of motifs bunched together. This really has a lot of elegance in the way it lets the elements breathe and negative space means that you have a lot of room for a really great ground fabric. So I chose one of my favorite for me talk about this a lot, Legacy Linen 37 Count Wild Honey. And this is what I'm doing with it. I have made some changes. I didn't feel like all of the numbers were necessary, so that meant I had to leave out the birds as much as I like them, and then I just cheated everything up for a more compressed design. And then I also, instead of black, 
went to some of my favorite browns here just because I thought they worked better with the reds, the greens, and the accentuate that I was using here. So I'm going to finish this into a drum after um, Stacey Nash had a wonderful presentation of a drum on Instagram recently where I was sitting on a little cake plate and had greenery arranged around the bottom and I looked at that and thought, oh, I have just the pattern for that. The other thing I'd like to note about this, so again, if you're going to do something with a lot of negative space, you have to really like your ground fabric, which is why I used Wild Honey here, because you are seeing a great deal of it. So how it plays with the colors, how it looks in terms of all that negative space, again, really, really important. And these are my threads. I'll list all of these in the description below. There are a couple that I made very limited use of. So 634 and creme are only used in two places. If you wanna follow the stitch but you're watching your budget, I know silk is expensive, those would be two really easy places to sub those out. So 634, which is admittedly one of my favorite browns and very useful to have, is used only in the basket here on the roof and then crown is used only for the fence on the house everywhere else that there's white i've used a different color than accentuate than what i've been using recently and mixed with swasophene so this is 312 and it has this wonderful blue green iridescence that i think works beautifully with the main green that I've picked here. This is 103 and I love this color so much that when I was organizing my 103s recently in the big um, acrylic drawer case that I showed you in my whip party, I realized that I had bought this exact color four times. Seemingly every time I've been to Needle in a Haystack recently, I have looked through the 103, thought, oh, that's such a great green and bought it and then, yeah, keep on buying it. So I really need to start using it. And I think it looks just great with the red and with the wild honey and with this color accentuate, which yeah, again, not showing up, but sparkly and very fun in person. So as you can see, I am getting very close to a finish on this. I hope to have it finished into a drum by the next time I see you, and I will be using my own blocking tutorial from the Simple Harmony Tutorials to block this out because I've been working it on hand and the distortion is pretty bad, especially where I have block stitching. Not sure how much this is gonna show in camera, but as you can see, the lines under the house are not straight. The um, branch of greenery is not straight. And because these are going to be parallel lines running parallel to the bottom of the drum, that distortion would drive me nuts. So I am going to do a full blocking job on this once I have finished my stitching. And before I get to the finishing, I think it will really improve the look. But this is Cranberry Christmas, which I think is turning out beautifully. It's a little more restrained than some of my Christmas pieces, but I think that's fun. And I hope you like it too. Again, I'll put all the threads and materials in the description below. And then, oh, travel. So as you can see, I am back from my trip. I had a great time. My students were wonderful, everyone did great in class and it was just lovely to be with other stitchers, to meet some kindred spirits, and I got to meet my very first Simple Harmony stitcher in the flesh. One of my students is stitching the box and had brought it as her project for the stitching room. So I came in the first day and there it was, which was just so cool and it was lovely to meet you and really quite extraordinary to see this project coming to life 
under someone's hands, not my own. So that was very exciting for me. And I've had the pleasure of talking to many of you who are working the box through comments, through DMs, through social media, emails, but there was something very special about seeing it in person for the first time that wasn't my own stitching essentially. But since I was traveling and I can't go anywhere without taking my stitching, I put a lot of effort into thinking what I would bring with me because I was going to be gone for almost a week and I can't not stitch for a week, that's unthinkable. I have an absolute horror of sitting around with empty hands. Even if I'm just watching a movie, I always have to be doing something and that something is pretty much always stitching. So I put all of this effort into thinking, okay, what is the right size? What would keep me occupied the whole week? And because my big whip right now, which is the lid, for my Brunemark casket is, as you can see, large and not easily transported. I left this behind. There wasn't anything on this that I could really take with me. It all needs to be worked on the ground fabric and I need to have my floor stand to work with my slate frame. So that was out and I took a look at the rest of the designs and decided to work some detached pieces for the next panel which will then be applied to the ground fabric. So the thing is, I didn't really get any stitching done. The needle lace slips I prepared have had nothing done. Really exciting. These are my threads that I will eventually be using. These are the historic blues from Trisha's Cabinet of Curiosities color line, which I just love. And then I also prepared a, what you would call an embroidered slip. So this is going to be worked separately and then when I have finished the stitching, the edges will be turned under and it will be applied to the prepared ground, basically stitched applique, right? And just keep in mind, this has pretty much all been done since I got home. This is the embroidered slip that I'm making and this is all split stitch and the shading is very characteristic of 17th century English amateur embroidery. These very bold color progressions and bright colors are very, very historically inspired because this casket is in many ways a tribute to favorite elements from my own favorite historic caskets and it's got this there you can see just the wonderful shine that the silk gives to it so these are the colors which again these are the pinks from Trisha's historic color range and this is in Soie de Paris oh, beautiful aren't those just gorgeous but the funny thing is this was pretty much all done either on the plane or since I got back because I put in all of this effort preparing my travel pieces thinking what would be small, what would be portable, what would be lightweight since I didn't have my floor stand with me and I hate stressing out my hands holding too much weight while I'm stitching. So I went to all this trouble and then I got there and the stitching room, you know, unsurprisingly, you're chatting with other stitchers and I at least wasn't getting much stitching done when I was in the stitching room. And then the room had no light in it. I mean, zero light. There was no overhead light. There were only two dinky little lamps it was a disaster and I had not thought to bring a travel light with me, I guess, because I am really out of practice with this whole travel thing since the pandemic. And I was pretty mortified at my own lack of forethought and also, you know, bored when you're just trying to wind down at night and that would normally be, I would be putting in stitches and you know, couldn't do that. So I got home and thought, you know, I need a travel light. I cannot let this happen again. And then thankfully, Nicola Parkman of Hands Across the Sea to the rescue. I was watching her this weekend and she showed that fabulous, fabulous travel lamp she just bought. The one, the telescoping one that folds into nothingness. 
amazing. It's the Daylight Folded Glow. If you haven't seen it, I'll link it in the description because mine's not here yet, but I have already purchased it. The second she pulled that out, I just hit pause on the video and scurried off to order one for myself because having just had this experience, I don't want to repeat it. I have actually gotten quite a bit done because is this really going to focus? These are all tiny, tiny slip stitches and this is full coverage. This is a great deal of work, but this has pretty much all been since I got home. I was pretty tired and just the mechanical filling work going on here really suited my mood. So I've been working on this pretty much all week since I got back and making some progress. So this will be for the next panel of my Britomar casket, not the lid which I have shown you previously I think this is episode 14 the really big whip and unfortunately Brita Mart has not had any progress at all she is really quite close to a finish there's not that much more that needs to be done with her um, I need to finish Brita Mart herself Radiga needs her spears and her finishing touches and then the tree here needs to be finished, but since I have um, not very intense techniques in mind for this, it really just needs me to sit down and devote my full attention to this for a little while, and I can whip out a finish here without any crazy investment of time. It's just my focus has been elsewhere. So I hope I will get back to this very soon, but in lieu of actual stitching updates on my very big whip, I thought I would update you a little bit on her story. We will be returning to this and talking more about the techniques and the threads involved. I did really only just give you a general overview in that episode and there were a lot of questions about what were the threads, what were the techniques. We will talk about all of that. We just have so much other stuff today that I did the episode would go on forever. So the story on Britta Mart is that she is a British princess who looks into a magic mirror to see her destiny and she falls in love with the man pictured therein, Artigal, and she goes on a quest to find him in Fairyland. And then she dresses up as a male knight, eventually revealing herself as a female knight. And it's at that point in the story when she fights Radagant, when she has revealed herself as female and she's no longer dressing up as a male knight. Is this making any sense? I hope it is. And to look to visual inspiration, how do you dress a knight who is female and embracing her female identity? I decided to look to the Walter Crane book of illustrations from the Fairy Queen. And I, Britta Mart is pictured at many points in the illustrations but the ones I found most inspiring were his illustrations of her battle with Radigund when you have armor combined with skirts and flowing hair. So as you can see, Radigund herself is actually closely inspired by the Walter Crane illustration and how I did that is something we will get into. And then Britta Mart has got basically a chainmail skirt, much as is pictured here, and her elaborate feathered helmet, which were inspired directly by the Walter Crane illustrations. So inspiration can come from a lot of places. As much as this casket is a tribute to the historic pieces that have inspired me, some of my actual granular, how did I render that, came from something done centuries later in Walter Crane's illustration. Another question I got asked about this that I'd like to answer is, why did I pick the Fairy Queen? It's a pretty weird inspiration for a gasket. I'll concede that point. And it's because I love this story and it provides really rich 
visual fodder and to me a very engaging and engrossing story because when you're doing a really big project like a casket you have to love what you're doing so that you will see it through to the end the story has to give you enough material to cover the outside of the box you have to be engaged enough with it that you want to stitch it and you also have to love the actual stitching experience. So that's really what's guided a lot of my choice of materials, things that I find pleasant to stitch with because you can't put in this many stitches if you're not enjoying yourself. It just doesn't work. So what do I love and what will carry me through this project has been a lot of what's guided my decisions. And again, we will get into that in more detail when we return to this panel. And I hope to have some progress to show you along with an in-depth discussion of how did I get these effects and why did I choose these colors and techniques. So look forward to that in future episodes. And then I also had something very exciting arrive, which is the box I found to hold my Marie Antoinette small. So in the last episode, I showed you my first FFOs, which were the pin cushion that looks like a little cake and the scissors keep that I have been updating you on this since I came up with the idea. And this is the box that I found to hold them. This is an antique inlaid box. It's in pretty good shape. The corners are pretty neat. The varnish is a little all damaged on top, but I love this detailing on the lid and it has a couple of other important points here, which are the scale is right to the objects. You don't want a box that would be so much bigger and it had a pretty rough interior. This is not original and oh, it's the receipt. It's not in good shape and it's something that I feel absolutely no guilt about ripping out and replacing with something that will better complement my pieces. This box is a little on the small side so I'm thinking I would like to try and get a tray made to put in this to hold the shallower pieces like the scissors keep and then I can put the deeper ones in the bottom. So we'll see how that goes and I will be keeping you updated on my revision of the interior as I rip this out and replace it with something more suited to my smalls and to the idea of the Marie Antoinette sewing box. But many of the boxes I found were in condition that was too good. So the interior matched the exterior and it wasn't something that you would want to rip out and replace. This was the perfect combination of being, you know, reasonably priced, having a lovely exterior, and then what's inside is not original and not in good condition. So I don't feel guilty about just ripping it right out. So this is the home for my Marie Antoinette Smalls, which I am really looking forward to embellishing. I was thinking that I might do posies anchored in the lid. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to go about that just yet, but it's something that I'm thinking about. And yeah, let's see where I go with this. If this suggests any exciting ideas to you, please feel free to share them in the comments because I think this has a lot of potential and that this could be a really fun project. So that's Marie Antoinette and then I also wanted to talk about Simple Harmony for a minute. There have been a lot of people making great progress on the stitch along. As I mentioned, I met my first Simple Harmony stitcher in the flesh recently. And since then, I have been thinking about how to inspire you to a finish because we are getting towards the end of the tutorials. The most recent one to go up was on gluing your embroidered sides 
to the box. The next tutorial, which will go up on March 24th, is about gluing the lid to the embroidery on the lid to the prepared lid of the box. And then the final tutorial, which will go up on April 7th, is going to be about the overall finishing of the box, applying the trim, finishing out the bottom, et cetera, et cetera. So after April 7th, you will have everything that you need in terms of tutorials to finish once you get to that point. And because I know the finishing can be very daunting, I want to provide some extra incentive to get you over the line and I will be offering three prizes for the first three complete finishes of Simple Harmony boxes. There's no time limit on this. They get claimed when they get claimed because this is not a stitch along with you know set dates or anything. You can work on your own pace and that is just fine. It takes as long as it takes you and there's nothing wrong with that. But I will be showing you the first prize on the next episode. So I hope you will tune in for that. Okay, I almost forgot. I also promised you a giveaway for this episode and it is a book from my own collection. This is lightly used and it is Helen M. Stevens' World of Embroidery. So Helen M. Stevens is a pretty big name in surface embroidery. She does these beautiful pieces in silk in flat untwisted filament silks and this is a look into some of her many projects. She's very prolific and she's written multiple books. Um, one note about World of Embroidery, this is eye candy. There's a little bit about technique in here and about her process, but it is not a project book or a how-to book. It's very much a look at the beautiful things that she does, which are indeed beautiful. And I was inspired to share this with you today because I've been doing a little silk shading myself, albeit with twisted filament silks that are much thicker than the very fine silks that Helen M. Stevens uses. But I love her floral and natural scenes. And I hope that the next owner of this book will as well. So if you'd like to be entered in the giveaway for World of Embroidery, please put book in your comment and I will draw the winner before the next episode. And then I would just like to finish with a quick note that I am holding the people of Ukraine in my heart. I have struggled with whether or not to say anything here. It feels like floss tube isn't the right place, but at the same time, it feels even more wrong not to acknowledge that there's a world that exists outside my four walls and all the suffering that is undergoing in Ukraine right now. So I would just point you to Brenda and Laura's most recent episode. They opened with some beautiful and eloquent thoughts on the subject. They expressed it much better than I can myself. And while I'm deeply troubled and moved, I have had a really hard time trying to address it here, basically. So I hope you'll watch Brenda and Laura. If you haven't seen them already, you probably have, and that you will also be holding the people of Ukraine in your hearts. So for next time, whiplash from the change of topic there, but for the next time, which will be the new episode will go up on March 28th, I will be showing you a completed casket panel from the Britomart casket. This is the first panel in her journey as a knight and I had a lot of fun making it. I used some very fun technical tricks which we'll be looking at and I hope you're excited to see it because I am very excited to share it with you. So until then, happy stitching.